All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Mr. Yu. Good evening, students and my fellow alumni. I would like to welcome everyone to today's Bukit Tima Dialogue. We appreciate your presence after a long and tiring day. Many of us come from school and then some of us come from work today. So we appreciate that you guys uh, took time out today to come to this session. So before we start, I'd like to uh, extend my heartfelt thanks to Gabriel and the MPP Senior Class Committee for organizing and putting this together. I also like to thank Liza and the team at the Student Life Committee for facilitating the logistics. And I also like to thank Mr. Yo, who has made time out of his busy schedule to come and share with us today. So today's dialogue is titled ASEAN Adjusting to Geopolitical Tides. So in the past decades, ASEAN has, seen, or has been seen as a champion of the third way, which is the ASEAN way, an approach to international relations through regional consensus and cooperation through a disciplined policy approach of non-interference and neutrality, and healthy skepticism regarding a consensus on ideological values, ASEAN has, despite road bumps along the way, progressed steadily to its path of collective prosperity. But in the recent years, geopolitical problems have emerged. So we see, for example, in Rohingya, the Myanmar coup, uh, and the South China Sea dispute, he has brought increased scrutiny to ASEAN, and he has got people thinking, what is the way forward for ASEAN? So how can ASEAN adjust to the changing geopolitical tides? To help us gain clarity on this question, we have an ASEAN insider, a former military general, Minister for Information and the Arts, Health, Trade Industry, and Foreign Affairs. Beyond his 23 years in governance, he has also served as the chairman of the Hong Kong headquartered Carry Logistics, and was most recently senior advisor to the investment holding company, Port Group. Both of, both of all of this is to say that he actually has extensive invest, investment and operational uh, both of this is to say that actually Mr. Yu has such experience in ASEAN, be it in business and in policy. So let us all put our hands together to welcome Mr. Yu for his opening address. Mr. Yu, please. How many are online? 40 plus those who are physically here. Oh. Well, thank you all for, for uh, joining me this, this evening. Uh, Keith invited me to talk a little about ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN only uh, makes sense in relation to the larger world. ASEAN is consequential because, because we are weak, because we don't threaten anybody. We don't have missiles, we don't have nuclear weapons. Our neighbors are much bigger than us. And we succeed by being neutral, by being friendly to everybody, by being soft. Internally, we are probably the most diverse region in the world in terms of ethnicity, in terms of religion, in terms of political systems. Uh, languages used, people from mainland Southeast Asia, people from archipelagic Southeast Asia, people who live by the sea, people who live in the mountains. The, re the reason for ASEAN's diversity is geography. Between the Australian plate and the Himalayas, the land is all crinkled up because of tectonic plate movements. So some parts are at sea, some are attached to the Asian mainland. The land is corrugated. So the people in the valleys are different from the people up in the highlands. They interact. It's hard to invade Southeast Asia because of the terrain, because of malaria. So China has always been a little reluctant to go down south. The Vietnamese have been moving south over the years. The Indians, when they go to the Northeast, to the Seven Sisters, to the Seven, uh, what do you call it? Um, Meghalaya, Mizoram, yeah. uh, Assam, all these. They're full of minorities. In a sense, Southeast Asia extends to Yunnan and Guangxi and extends into Northeast India. This is really Southeast Asia in all its diversity. The winds bring influence from South Asia, from East Asia. 
when half the year it blows one way, the other half it blows the other way. And it brings along with it people, trade, ideas, institutional models. So Southeast Asia is a mis mishmash. But you'll find a bit of China in every Southeast Asian country. You'll find a bit of India in every Southeast Asian country. And there's a bit of each other in, in each other's countries. So I like to describe Singapore as being the most ASEANized country in ASEAN because all the other nine countries have sizable communities in Singapore. The Filipinos, the Myanmar, Indonesians, Vietnamese, everywhere. And you know, in a university, if you have to put on an ASEAN performance, it's not difficult because we have uh, students from all these countries. So in some sense, Singapore reflects ASEAN reflects the tensions of ASEAN, reflects the diversity of ASEAN. The world is now going through an interesting period. There's a sense that something is happening. Something big is going to happen. And people are all feeling a little uneasy. I mean, we're still partying, we're still drinking, we're still enjoying normal life, but it's like a background music, you know, like distant thunder that we're able to hear, which is a little unsettling. For a number of years now, the Americans have been identifying China as the biggest threat. Not that China can threaten the US, but China threatening US dominance in the world. When the Americans talk about rule-based order, it's really an American controlled rules-based order. China says the only rules-based order is the UN. And on many issues, the Americans don't care about the UN. They operate on their own. But you know, at the end of the Second World War, the US economy was almost half the global economy. So the US is a very powerful country. It's a very wealthy country. And a lot of the developments in Asia that we've seen in the last few decades, all the years that you grew up, it was made possible by an American peace. In some ways, the American dream became the Asian dream. But as Asians recover their own dignity and identity, they do not want to be talked down to by the Americans or by the Europeans. Because for a long time, we were colonized. And when we were colonized, we were treated like dirt. So I don't think Asians likely take to lectures from the West about human rights or about values. Not that they think they're perfect, they know they're imperfect, but they just emotionally don't like former colonial powers telling them what to do or what's wrong with them. So increasingly they're hitting back that, hey, look, your own societies are not perfect either. A lot of problems. So when they accuse China of genocide in Xinjiang, China puts up charts, you know. Before Columbus, millions of Indians in North America. After Columbus, now only a few left. They say, that's genocide. Well, of course it was genocide. But that was in the past. It was a terrible past. They brought in 10, Af 10 million Africans to North and South America. They not many went to, North, to the US, many went to Brazil, to Central America. But it was a very cruel period in human history. And the 20th century was a very bloody century. We hope that this century, people will be more wiser, more compassionate, and have learned. But sometimes the way the great powers interact with each other. 
you wonder whether history has changed. You know, it's, it's, it's so sad. It's so sad. I think in China, they are prepared for a long period of struggle with the US. They do want to escalate, but they see US moves as in terms of decades. So when the US and Australia and the UK created AUKUS, the submarine deal, I mean, it'd be 20, 30 years before Australia sees those submarines. So they're thinking way into the century, down the century. When FBI keeps saying that China is subverting the US through an all society approach, they're saying, look, the students, Chinese students in America are a danger to us. For those who are in the STEM field, you know, the science, technology, engineering, mathematics, because this creates long-term capabilities. So China is now asking itself, we have to prepare for a long period of struggle. The US may suddenly weaponize the financial system, may sanction China, may disrupt the Belt and Road. China doesn't want to escalate because China knows that it's getting stronger. So better to just to play along, but don't show weakness because if you show weakness, you invite more trouble. So China has developed the dual circulation economy where the internal economy is robust against external interference, whereas the external circulation economy, which China still wants, but which it knows will be disrupted from time to time. And they do not want to be hostage to a particular vulnerability that you do this like with a threaten war or threaten uh, violence, then it becomes too tense. So a friend of mine said, if you look at the Chinese market, China is shorting itself before the market short China. So that it does things according to its own rhythm when it's prepared, deflate the property market. Don't allow your young people to be addicted to games. Have laws and regulations on data manipulation and data use. And internationally, they're prepared for decoupling. They don't want decoupling, but they are signaling that if you want to decouple, decouple. We are prepared for, for a decoupled world. We don't want it. So that decoupling cannot be used by a weapon against China. So they've listed all their vulnerabilities and trying to make sure that for every one of them, they have a solution. That's what they think, that's the way they're thinking. So you look at these Winter Olympic Games. They've done very well. No other country can put up games like this. And winter sports will be, will open up a new world in China. China is very late in winter sports. I mean, when did skiing begin in China? It's only in the last few years. But China has lots of snow. And China has lots of slopes. And China has lots of people. And after Ku Ai Ling and Su 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 Yi Ming, there's a lot of excitement in China now. And young people are going to go into winter sports. But the Western countries are not happy. So they want to boycott the games. No, you can't have a good party. We will sabotage your party. <laughs> No, I have a tune to the BBC. They look for all the faults and they concentrate on the faults. One Olympic medalist said, American, you know, it was reported in the South China Morning Post, that the media is deliberately 
painting a negative picture, even though those of us who are, who are there in Beijing say that, wow, the, the welcome is tremendous. Things are in fact working very well. But there is a mood in, in the US and the mood in some Western countries. A discomfort that China is rising and that for the first time after a long time, non-whites, are answering back, refuse to be dominated. Emotionally, psychologically, it's not easy to accept. Economically, fine, they see the numbers. They can criticize each other, French, Germans, Americans, Australians. But if China dares to criticize them, they get very angry. And if, China, and if they criticize China, China is not allowed to bark back. If you bark back, they put a hat on you, wolf warrior. Wolf warrior. I've been watching this, and I said, this is a psychological campaign. So in Singapore, it's not just because Singapore is three quarters ethnic Chinese. I think the Malays are also feeling that, no, this is not right. The Indians have a different reaction somewhat because of India's own problem with China, which creates a certain conflict. Naturally, the Americans too quiet, they're hoping that they can get India against China. But I think India is too smart for that. India will play its own game. I remember being with Jai Shankar, the foreign minister. I said, you know, India will get an S-400 air defense system? He said, of course. I said, US will, will sanction India? He said, regardless. So India <laughs> invited Putin, and India and Russia have a strategic military cooperation long-term program because India is too big a country to ever want to be dependent on anybody. Yes, there are quarrels over the, the border area. And it, 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 on China's side, they control the public emotion. In fact, until recently, most Chinese have forgotten that there was a war in 62 between India and China. But in India, because of the free media and because of domestic politics, these things get paid up. So it's harder to manage. The border between India and China will have to be negotiated because there's no settled border. The British drew the McMahon line. It was an agreement with the Tibetan government at a time when the British recognized the Qing dynasty as suzerain, which meant that it had no legal validity. And on the Western side, the British drew some lines. China never accepted those lines. So the entire border will have to be negotiated. The line of control, the arguments over whether you were there last year or five years ago, or 10 years ago, I'm not sure. <laughs> this, uh, this could well be on Mars. You know? This is a really difficult terrain. So I think eventually both sides will calculate that it's not in the interest to collide, but they would like to put pressure on each other. And for the Indians, if America wants to use me and put pressure on China, that's not a bad thing. Russia is playing a very equidistant game. So Russia supplies S-400 to the Indians, to China, tries to mediate between the two, in the recent statement between Xi Jinping and Putin, when Putin attended the Olympic Games, the statement was, we will two hours to continue to work on Russia, China, India relations. It, 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 it was given a separate paragraph. So the game goes on. But what is more immediately, immediately troubling is what's happening in the Ukraine. 
Last July, Putin wrote a piece, an essay, a very thoughtful essay called The Historical Unity of Russia and Ukraine. Historical Unity. About how Russia began in Kyiv, Rus. And he cited one Russian prophet who said, let Kyiv be the mother of all Russian cities. And he went to the history of the Veliko Russians, the Great Russians, the Belarusians, and the Mela Russians, the Little Russians, and how these have become different countries. Putin was in the KGB, and he watched how the Soviet Union collapsed. And he became a taxi driver at that time in Leningrad, later St. Petersburg. He watched how Yeltsin was manipulated by the West and by the oligarchs. So when he assumed power, he was determined to put a stop to it. He said, it is not enough for the US and for some countries in the West that we have broken up the Soviet Union. Russia as it is today is still too big for them. And they prefer Russia to be broken up further. When Baker worked during the, the fourth Berlin Wall, they were doing everything Gorbachev wanted and telling Gorbachev that in the EU, United Germany, NATO will not move into East Germany. When Yeltsin complained later, he said, no, but that was verbal, you know, we, there's no, no concrete agreement. And since then, NATO has been expanding eastwards to the Baltic republics, Poland, Romania. And these countries, have for a long time suffered under the Soviet Union. So they want the Americans, they want NATO to be there. Kissinger a long time ago wrote, Ukraine must always be a buffer state. The moment you try to win it for one side, Russia has to react. When I read the piece written by Putin in July last year, I felt very uneasy. I said, this is a very deep, feeling, you know, and I've been telling a lot of people, I said, it's going to be trouble. The response from the West has been very dismissive. It's unreasonable. NATO must always be open to anybody. It threatens nobody. Russia says, you have missiles, troops all on my border, you say you threaten nobody. <laughs> Obviously, the Russians having been deceived or led on for repeatedly, you don't blame them for not trusting the West. So because they've threatened to take decisive moves recently, so there is alarm in the West. The Americans are saying that, oh, Russia is going to invade anytime soon. In Europe, the leaders are all scrambling to go to Kyiv, to go to Moscow. And now they have pressured Zelensky, the president of Ukraine. No, you should not ask to join NATO. NATO can't say we don't admit Ukraine because NATO is high-minded, it's got its rules. How can we ever say such a thing that, that Ukraine cannot join NATO? But you should say that you don't want to join. So the market say, ah, tensions are easing. Then Putin said, no, this won't do because it's just worse. Tomorrow you change your mind and you say it's only worse. There's no written agreement. I don't think the tension has evaporated because the Russians are asking for a formal agreement which the Americans and Europeans are reluctant to give. 
So something may happen. What will happen? I don't know. I don't think Russia will just go in and invade Ukraine. That's too crude, and you'll create more problems for Russia. So I decided to reread what Putin wrote last July, a second time. You know, it's quite a long article. I said I better read it again, just to understand how he's thinking. I said, oh, he talks about many things. He talks about different groups in Ukraine. He talks about the Dnieper River. I said, oh. He talks about Crimea, of course. This is a dangerous period. And when he went to China, they issued a joint statement, which is many pages long. It's very unusual because to prepare a joint statement like that normally would take many months. They probably rushed it, so it probably took many weeks. But that joint statement covers everything. From the UN, it covers NATO, China for the first time, took a very clear position against NATO's eastward expansion. In the entire long piece, not a single mention of Ukraine, not one word. It was deliberate because the Chinese do not want to be politically involved in it. They talk about WTO, about SEO, about BRICS. They talk about chemical warfare. They talk about bi biological warfare facilities, which the Americans have or the borders of Russia and China. They talk about China, Russia, India cooperation. They talk about in the last paragraph on ASEAN, that they work with ASEAN. The ASEAN is important. Then they mentioned in one sentence that there's no area of exclusion in cooperation between Russia and China. No area exclusion. Every area we can cooperate. It's a very interesting statement. I recommend that all of you read it, you know. I asked myself, why was this issue? I said, oh, I think both sides are expecting something to happen, some storm to come. And when the storm comes, Russia and China will have to work together, even though the winds are howling, the waves are higher than the ships. So they better know exactly where they can cooperate and where they are not cooperating. So better be very clear before the storm comes. The Americans are not happy with the statement. They said, no, you are helping Russia. And they said, if you help Russia, we will punish you. The Australian Prime Minister, who must have read the statement and did not see a single mention of Ukraine, he said, China is chillingly silent on Ukraine. But it was deliberate. So you have now a situation US China, which involves Taiwan, the Senkaku or Taoyu Islands, South China Sea. And you have on the other side, Ukraine and the future of Europe. Here we are in ASEAN. I think we should just be very alert to what's happening and <laughs> try to not get involved. You know, we try not to get involved in ASEAN. It's, it's just, there's no profit in being involved. These are games played by big players. I mean, India will, I think India doesn't want to get involved either. <laughs> this is too big a game. For the, for the opening of the Winter Olympics, Singapore is represented by our president, Halima, and our foreign minister. So I asked a Russian friend, how many sportsmen do you think Singapore sent to the Winter Olympics? Is it two, three? 
I say zero. Think about that. Why did Singapore send the president, the foreign minister, to the Winter Olympic Games when we don't have a single sportsman competing there? And when Winter Olympics, when, and when winter sports are not a big deal in Singapore, people go skiing, but that's it. Why? Well, we were very close to the Americans. I mean, our bases here used by the US Navy, US Air Force. I was from the Air Force, all advanced equipment, F-15, F-16s, our drones, all from the Americans. But when they, they want to spoil the Chinese Winter Olympic Party, we say, no, we'll, we'll come, we'll come. <laughs> so we are playing our own little game to please all sides to be neutral. This is a game which every country in ASEAN plays. And it is a collective interest of ASEAN to hold to that position and don't get involved. There's no profit in being involved. But watch what's happening. Because what's happening will affect us as countries, as companies. And no one will be unaffected. So just the threat of war in Ukraine means send up all prices. It's, I think reaching $100 a barrel. That has implications on everything. Uh, I think inflation will begin to rise and you create political problems in every country. Every country will have to react. So we can't stop the storms, but we must know where the epicenters are and try to find the least turbulent route to take and make sure that our hatches are fully battened. We have a raincoat on and everybody on deck. So maybe I end here, Keith, and, and then happy to have a dialogue. Thank you, Mr. Yeo. Thank you for your insightful speech. I've learned a lot. I think are many things that you have shared just now. I was waiting for, for you to, you know, finally talk about ASEAN throughout the whole time, but it seems that you're setting the stage to actually point out that ASEAN should continue doing what it does best, which is to stay neutral and stay independent. So with that, uh, I would like to open the floor up to the questions. Uh, open the, the questions up to the floor, sorry. Well, can't, can't, can't be thinking now. So I'm opening up the, the, the floor for you to ask questions uh, to Mr. Yu. So let me just give a few ground rules. So if you have a question, uh, you can just raise up your hand, uh, turn on your mic, and then please state your name, your class. And then for those who are alumni, just state your job uh, in case just now you didn't introduce yourself. And uh, you can uh, enunciate your questions because we're wearing our masks. So you might want to slow down and enunciate your questions. Okay. So uh, I'll leave, uh, let the live audience ask the questions first. So anyone can take the floor. Don't shy. It's LKY SPP. Hi, good evening, um, Mr. George. Um, my name is Paul. I'm from MPP Junior Cohort. So on uh, these two days, uh, I see um, um, published reports on the state of Southeast Asia. So there's a finding that uh, nearly 60% of the ASEAN uh, respondents uh, express their distrust towards uh, China. So how would China perceive this? Uh, would it be intensify any uh, situations right now in the ASEAN region? ASEAN has uh, overtaken Europe as China's number one trading partner uh, for some years now. Uh, ASEAN's trade with China is much greater than the US ASEAN, uh, US China trade. And every country finds its Chinese account growing. There's more Chinese money, more Chinese investments. Uh, yeah, from Johor, there's a huge durian market in China. Very soon, we in Singapore will have to compete with every Chinese province for Malaysian durians. It is a very distressing thought. I, I told a friend of mine who's in the oil palm business, you know, there was a time when most of Malaya was planted with rubber trees. Then the South, like Johor, the rubber trees were taken over by oil palm. I think one day, <laughs> many oil palm plantations 
will be taken over by durian trees. So this is the reality. China per capita is still very low, and already it is a huge market. By the time its per capita reaches half that of the US, which is possible. China's GDP will be the size of Europe, America, and Japan combined. And this is just arithmetic, right? This is, I'm, I'm not forecasting anything. If it's half, then we just do the, the sums, but it follows population. Or maybe not Japan, maybe Europe and America combined. So when people find that they're becoming so dependent on China, and the Chinese are buying up properties and buying up shares and this and that, so there's a sense of uneasiness. You know? And instinctively, you want diversification. You're not going to slow down the China account. You say, no, no, let the China account grow. It's too, too important to me. Let it grow. But hey, no, Japan. America, Europe, come, come, you know, join us, you know, India. Hurry up, you know, we, we want to be more di diversified. You see? So this suspicion of China is partly the result of very rapid change in what people were used to in the past. And suddenly they have a new factor to consider. And many of us, mentally in the region, are used to reading you know, Financial Times, New York Times. We get our news from Reuters and from BBC. And they've been consistently downing China. Maybe they believe it, but there's a, a, a US-funded program to actually do negative reporting on China. I think it's partly deliberate, partly spontaneous, but we are getting all that flow into our minds in Southeast Asia. It will take time. And of course, how the Chinese deal with their PR is very important. They are not very good at it because it's new to them. They don't have the same facility in the English language, in European languages. Uh, so unlike India, China was never colonized. So in India, you can find writers who can write in English as well as any American or British writer. But you can't find such writers in China. In, in, in China. You can't find English speakers like you can find English speakers in India. So China will have to play it differently. CGTN is uh, becoming quite good. Global Times is... Uh, enjoying itself, <laughs> but uh, this will have to be a big effort by China, but it'll take time. But in the end, people will judge a country by its actions, not merely by what it says. Hi, Mr. Yeo. So uh, I'm Ting Lan from MPP Senior. I actually have two questions. From where? Uh, MPP senior cohort. Oh. So yeah, so I'm currently still studying here. So I actually have two questions. So the first question will be on the similar topic of ASEAN. So since within ASEAN, the countries have different foreign policy alignments and some countries are more enmeshed in the US alliance system. Some countries tend to be a bit more pro-China. So will this be a challenge to ASEAN unity in the future? based on your experiences. And my second question will be more about some of, uh, could you share some of your past experiences as the Minister for Foreign Affairs in Singapore in terms of um, Singapore's position in ASEAN as well as ASEAN's position in the US-China rivalry? Thank you. It's true that some countries are closer to some major powers than others. So the Philippines has a love-hate relationship with the Americans. You know, when the Filipinos wanted the Americans to leave Clark and Subic, they used to joke, you know, uh, go home GI, but bring me with you. 
for many Filipinos, there is a strong wish to go to America. And in America, there are many successful Filipinos working in many industries. But you find them overrepresented say, in healthcare, in, in, in accounts. Vietnam also has a love hate relationship with China. Uh, has a love hate relationship with China. They were for a thousand years part of China from, from Han Dynasty all the way to Tang. And it was only after Tang that they, be, they, they, they became independent. But even though independent, until the French came, they were always a tributary state of China. Even when the name, when they wanted to change the name Dai Viet, sorry, they wanted to change the name to, uh, from Dai Viet to Nan Viet. They had to get permission from the Qing Dynasty. The Qing Dynasty scholars went through the books and said, no, you can't do that because Viet by definition is part of China. So you can be Vietnam, south of Viet not none yet. So in Vietnam, even though they used a Romanized script, which was created by Alexander Rhodes, a great Jesuit, their history is in Chinese. I once had a conversation with a, a retired deputy prime minister. When he was the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, he was a minister in attendance of Lee Kuan Yew. I was in that delegation. His name is Vo Kuan, Vo Kuan. Vu, Wu, Chinese. I said, how are relations with China? He said, foreign ministry, the foreign ministry, hmm, sometimes tense. Army to army, normal. Party to party, Good. The relationship between the Vietnamese Communist Party and Chinese Communist Party are intimate relations. But they have conflicts of interest. They settle their land border, but there's a quarrel over the South China Sea. So the Vietnamese wants the Americans around, not because they love the Americans. I mean, even though they fought the Americans <laughs> through a horrible period, and the Americans bombed Vietnam, I mean, apart from the dikes in the north, they did everything they could to prevent North Vietnam from sending forces to the south. The Americans dropped on Laos more tonnage of bombs than was dropped on all of Europe during the Second World War. There's still large parts of Vietnam, where the soil has been poisoned by dioxin, a defoliant, you see. So the Vietnamese have a love-hate relationship with the Americans and a love-hate relationship with the Chinese. In the end, they're only pro-Vietnamese. You can run through the other countries. Thailand has a very successful tradition of balancing external forces. Indonesia will never be subject to one party or the other. It's a great sense of itself. So I would say in different ways, with different histories, all the countries of Southeast Asia do not want to be aligned to one big power or another. So when there's a crisis, even though our positions are a little divergent, like on Myanmar now, I think we are like a, a sticky rice, you know? It sticks together somehow, you know? It, will, it can be shaped in different ways, but the rice will stick together because it knows that if it becomes unstuck, that's a very dangerous position to be in. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Uh, my name is Tefis. I'm uh, MPP junior cohort. Uh, so I think just writing off your last point, my question is also on, on the current state of affairs in ASEAN, um, and particularly with the issue with the Myanmar coup, right? So we've seen that there's some push back um, from countries like Malaysia and Singapore after um, Cambodia Prime Minister Hansen went up, uh, went over to, uh, to, to, to Myanmar. 
Um, and internally, there's also some sort of uh, a difference in, in the way in which they're going to uh, take, take this, this conflict resolution. So I guess my question is, um, how, what's, what's your assessment of, of, of this so far um, after Cambodia uh, has taken over uh, ASEAN chairmanship? Um, and, and, and how do you see this, this situation un, uh, unfolding based on your assessment? It's heartbreaking uh, watching what's happening to Myanmar today. I was involved for many years of my life on Myanmar in different phases. Uh, I, Singapore was in the chair of ASEAN when the monks were being shot in Yangon. Then Singapore played a role in helping to create a tripartite arrangement after Saklo Najis in order to bring in the UN and international aid agencies into Myanmar. As Foreign Minister, I co-chaired the pledging conference with uh, at the time Prime Minister Tencent. Uh, that was in 2018 or 2019, I can't remember now. So we we work very hard to we work very hard to uh, achieve a peaceful transition, which was finally done. It was not perfect. The military still had veto power. This current breakdown arose over accusations by the military that the elections were not well conducted. They did not expect, and many people did not expect the military supported USDP party to win so few seats. Aung San Suu Kyi was dismissive of the complaints. So in the end, there was a rupture and the coup. I think all parties were to be blamed for the breakdown. And all parties will be involved in the solution. You can't have a solution without the NLD. You can't have a solution without the army. And the leading role will have to be played by ASEAN. Myanmar has a long border with China. It's got a border with India. These are big powers. And many of the minority groups in Myanmar have brethren in China and in India. So they, they, get, they get sucked in if there's armed struggle. In ASEAN, Thailand feels a kindred spirit to Myanmar because it's Theravada Buddhist. They've always had the history of the military being involved in politics. And the current Thai government itself was the result of a coup. So they, they, they're urging on us greater understanding. When Brunei was in the chair last year, it was too early. So the position was formal. Hun Sen is now in the chair. He took certain initiatives and got criticized. But I think it was right that he took those initiatives. And the criticisms will help him in his diplomacy. After Cambodia, it will be Indonesia in the chair. And Myanmar has always looked to Indonesia as a kind of model because Indonesia was once military dominated too. But eventually, without completely shunting the, the army aside, it was civilianized. So Indonesia will want to play will have to play a major role in the chair. And Cambodia will have to help pave the way. And it will take time. If ASEAN is too easy on the military government, then what happens in the country will be an affront to all of us. And even though we say no interference, there are minimum standards. You know, we don't want to be with cannibals and with <laughs> murderers in ASEAN. There must be a minimum standard of behavior. Then you can be part of ASEAN. And there's a sense that right now, those, 
minimum standards have not been met in Myanmar. I think they have to do better. But the opposition there has also been very forceful. And both sides will have to work together. And if ASEAN is involved, then ASEAN can be a kind of a third party to say, look, if you don't do this, I don't do that, then ASEAN can be involved. Then we find a way to the future. Yeah. So there's, we will need a lot of statesmanship and uh, skillful diplomacy in the coming one, two years. Cambodia will have to play a very important role. Indonesia's role after that will be decisive. The country has lost, has lost a lot of time. The good thing is both India and China, the big neighbors, they say, ASEAN, please take charge. <laughs> they, they don't want to get directly involved. They will help on the side. They're never going to cut links with whoever's in charge in Myanmar because it's too important. You know, for every Kachin in Myanmar, there are two Kachins in China. For every Wa in Myanmar, there's a Wa in China. The Kokans are ethnic Chinese. For the Indians, the Chins are the measles. The tribes are on both sides. And that is a very delicate part of India too, because, because India, you know, India has got a thin neck, the Siliguri corridor, and then you have a big northeast. So India doesn't want trouble in the northeast either. So India will, will whoever is in charge in Myanmar, will, India will work with, with that government. So ASEAN's role is critical. But it needs skillful diplomacy and it needs some tough messaging. So I have a question from the online audience. So it's from Abhishek, who's an alumni. He would like to ask the following two questions. The first question being, in my time at LKY SPP, three of my classmates from Myanmar and Afghanistan have had internal turmoil in the countries. So while Singapore doesn't accept political asylum, which I think many Southeast Asian countries don't, uh, should, uh, should Singapore step up to give preferential employment in such cases or uh, provide any other form of support? And then the second question is, given challenges such as the long-term impact of climate change, political turmoil affecting our ASEAN neighbors, uh, what should be the role of Singapore uh, particularly in contributing to their development and stability. So it's a more Singaporean-centric question. Is Abhishek uh, tuning in from India or from Singapore? I am Singaporean, Mr. Yeo. I'm uh, right on Zoom uh, in Tampines. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you're yeah, Singaporean? Yes, uh, yes. Oh, I, see. I, th I thought you were from India. What do you do, Abhishek? Uh, sir, I'm actually running NGOs in Singapore in the low-income space and also in the migrant workers space. And I also served with your son, William, in NS at Changi Air Base East in 2011. So good to be speaking. Please speak slower. I, ca I can't hear you. you you're a bit muffled. Speak slower. Uh, sorry, Mr. Yeah, I was just saying that I serve in the NGO sector um, and um, I've been working in the low-income space um, at Kabun Baru as well as running a migrant worker-based charity in Singapore. And I also served with your son, William, and 2011 and during uh, at Changi Air Base. So good to be speaking with you today. Yeah, Changi Air Base, national service. Thanks, yes. Abhishek. Sorry to mistake you for an Indian. <laughs> I thought... Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not that common the name in Singapore. Um, we have a sizable migrant population in Singapore helping us in different sectors. I think the last few years with COVID and other challenges, there's a common sense among Singaporeans that it's in our own enlightened self-interest to make sure that migrant workers are well-treated and well-cared for. It's become a moral issue in Singapore, which I think is a good thing. Um, but managing a substantial migrant worker population in Singapore is never an easy thing because there are a lot of tensions, a lot of associated problems. Uh, it's also a sector which opens itself readily to exploitation. Can Singaporeans take in more, uh, say, refugees? 
I don't think it's possible for Singapore to take in refugees because you need space and then you need jobs. And I think Singapore is, is, is expensive for, for foreigners who don't have jobs. You know? And there's a limit to what you can do to help them. But those who are already here helping us, we should treat them well. Those who are in other parts of Southeast Asia, where we can help, we should help, according to our strength. I think it's part of what we want to be as human beings, and it's what we want to stand for as Singapore. So I'm glad that you as a young man have decided as your calling to go into the NGO space and to help those less advantaged. But uh, yeah, okay. I think it's, it's not easy to discuss it abstractly. I think every NGO has got specific challenges and, and I'm sure you are facing them and, and, and I hope that uh, when you need the facilitation of government that government departments will be helpful to you. Thank you. Someone else? We have, a, we have a bit more time left, so maybe you can take a question. Hi, thank you so much uh, for your sharing just now. My name is Jessie and um, I'm an MPP alumni. Um, so I would actually like to go back to the earlier topic of Russia and Ukraine. And there are two areas where I'm curious to hear more of your thoughts on. So the first is with regards to the US communication strategy on what Russia is planning to do. So I think mm, it has been quite widely agreed that Russia would likely not make a move, even if it does intend to invade before the end of the Winter Olympics, because Putin doesn't want to um, antagonize Xi Jinping unnecessarily. And so I think it at least took me by surprise when the US came out to communicate that we could be seeing an invasion in the next 24 to 48 hours. And so I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are, are behind why US did that. And is there a particular strategy or reason behind that? Then the second aspect is with regards to um, how do you think Russia and Ukraine would have an impact on China and Taiwan, um, especially in the hypothetical situation if an invasion really happens? Thank you. I wonder too why the US have been so specific in telling the world that Russia is going to move imminently. I certainly take the Russian threat of responding to NATO's expansion seriously. And there's no doubt a military component to that response. But I don't think it would be a simple black or white response. It'd be more subtle than that. The US position is not entirely shared by France and Germany because they have their own interests. Germany has this pipeline going through the Baltics. It needs the gas. The Americans are blocking it. Why are they blocking it? To help Ukraine. The Americans have been sending military equipment to Ukraine. It's allowed Stinger missiles from the Baltic Republics to be transferred to Ukraine. The British have got trainers there too. The Germans refuse to supply military equipment. They supply only helmets and is donating a few hospitals. But the Germans will not help to arm Ukraine against Russia. Why? Well, Germany has a long history with, uh, with Russia. And I think it has uh, uh, maybe a, a better feel for what the Russians think and feel. The French are further away. 
Macron went to see um, Putin. He refused to take a PCR test. He didn't want his DNA to be revealed to the Russians. So he sat on a table, I think, 10 feet long from Putin. There's a funny picture, you know. On the Chinese social media, they, they put a lot of things on the table. <laughs> it's, it's quite funny. But anyway, even when Putin meets Lavrov, they still sit far away. It's part of the social distancing requirement. Putin said, Macron tormented me for five hours. He wouldn't go. No, he was pushing him on this day and the other. But Macron, in the end, said, Ukraine should be neutral. And when he said that, NATO was very angry. How can you say that? That's not our position. How can you take your own position? I think many European powers deep inside know that it is more stable for Europe if Ukraine is neutral. But I don't think America shares that position. Kissinger took that position years ago, but I don't think the Americans take that position. So the Russians are saying, look, well, if it's not, we have to react. If the Russians react, what happens? So I find it very interesting that when Russians threaten, they pull out their forces. You would have thought that if I'm supporting you, when you're threatened, I send more forces in. They pull out, they evacuate the embassy stuff. I thought, this is a very strange response. You're supposed to be helping me. So when I meet you now, you, you disappear. So what's the idea here? Is it to force the Ukrainians to say, I don't want to join NATO? I don't know. So when you ask me that question, my response is, I'm also thinking. I'm not sure. But there's, there are games being played, and the, the games are being played differently by different parties. One last question. Floor, anyone want to take it? What about from online? Anybody? If not, Chongyi. Oh, so, Tong Yi here. I'm a LKYS VP alumni. I study international affairs. Um, kind of interested in hearing your thoughts about the Chinese democracy. Um, how it, how it will look like uh, if it were to take root in China, and will it thrive as a political system? Yeah. So, uh, hope to hear your thoughts. In that statement between Xi Jinping and. Uh... Putin, the long statement about why they, are, they, are, they all subscribe to democratic values and they object to uh, the Americans and other Western countries using democracy to criticize them. For sure, Russia and China are not liberal demo democracies. But if you go to the root word of the word democracy, Demos and kratos. Demos means people. Kratos means master. So a system where the people are masters. We associate liberal democracy with voting. If you control the media and key institutions, you can shape people's minds. Today, you, you, you post on Facebook, no? and Facebook says, if you give me $5, I will boost your post. I thought, if I put $5, you boost my post. So if I don't give you $5, you will dampen my post, right? And that's how Facebook and Google have been able to command 80% of the ad revenues. So if you can manipulate consumers commercially, you have the same capability to manipulate them politically. Trump was the most successful leader in coming to power on the social media. A few tweets a day, and he orchestrated his supporters. 
they're so afraid of him, they've removed him. And they've not only removed him, they removed him from the server level. So AWS doesn't allow any sites supporting Trump, not supporting Trump, they're owned by Trump or, or carrying Trump uh, uh, platform of being, of making use of their, um, uh, their network. You see. Why? They are afraid that Trump can use social media against them. What does it mean? They can use the social media against anybody they want to. I was in Hong Kong during the time of the demonstrations. And I was convinced that the social media played a decisive role in demonizing the police, in favoring one side over the other. They selectively censored, removed sites which were pro-China. Who made those decisions? I don't think those decisions were made in Hong Kong. So when we say democracy, that somehow one man, one vote, the wisdom of the crowd, and hey presto, the best government emerges. Even if all of us had equal information, it is an act of faith that simple voting will create the best outcome. Maybe you take, say, your family. And will you, as a family, make decisions on the basis of one member, one vote, even if they're adults? Would the Catholic Church run itself on the basis of one man, one vote? Would a Buddhist monastery do that? So we have to ask ourselves, yes, if we have equal information, one man, one vote, make sure that the, the downtrodden are not ignored. So Amartya Sen, he won a Nobel Prize for Welfare Economics. He said, the moment you had elections, there are no more famines in India. Famines were not the result of a lack of food. It was a lack, it was the result of an inadequate political response to a lack of food. But today, I ask myself, you know, how much do we know? And who controls the media? Facebook? Google, Twitter, who has elected them? Who gave them that power? And the US Supreme Court has decided that you, you should not curb political spending, provided it's not done, it's not given to a political party. You can set up a spec. You can be at the court brothers, you can be Soros, you can spend billions of dollars and they could take ads and they will influence the, 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 the voters. So it's one man, one vote versus one dollar, one vote. In Singapore, we control spending. So it, any candidate, Booker's Party, PAP, don't need much money to, to, to stand for election. And we are close enough. Even if you think that Straits Times is biased or CLA is biased, we can talk to each other, right? I mean, we're just in the same neighborhood. So people have pretty good sense of what's happening. So democracy has this great advantage in that you cannot keep me, you cannot shut me up. I will be heard. But if everybody speaks and some have loudspeakers, sense around, and others are just using their voices, well, I, I may be heard if you strain your ear, but others are hogging the airwaves. You see. So democracy is not such a simple thing. To reduce it to voting is too great an oversimplification. In Singapore, we have compulsory voting. Australia has compulsory voting. Try to impose compulsory voting in the US. 
There'll be a revolt. So, I would say this whole subject of democracy is not a panacea. What you want is that the ideal should not be you govern a country, you harvest the land for a family or for a particular racial group. That in the ideal, it is for all people. In the practice, it never happens perfectly. But everyone is trying to do his best. So if you ask me to judge a society, we should never judge on the basis of how wealthy the top 10% is. You should judge on the condition of the bottom 10%. You look at China, you look at India, you look at Singapore, Hong Kong, the US. Look at the bottom 10%. How do they live? They are the ones who have, without megaphones. They're the ones who in the famine are the first to die. And I would say, by that criterion, China is not doing badly at all. To wrap this up, I think maybe you can just end with some final, one final uh, thought or one final question from you, which is, much of today's dialogue has really focused on the US-China involvement, not just in Southeast Asia, but across the, across the world. And we also talked about Russia and great, great power politics. So I guess the question is, you know, we see in the past one month or two months, both the US and China actually really express interest to deepen their links within Southeast Asia. So what do you think in the coming years ahead, would US and China do in Southeast Asia to, ex to really live up to their intent? No, if, if, if we are skillful and strategically disciplined, we will encourage them to compete for our friendship. So if China wants to build railroads and help us develop infrastructure, that's very good. And the Japanese feel that, oh, I want to help you too. Please, the Americans now say they also have a program. Wonderful. When I was MTI, I used to joke, you know, we should encourage China to build all the north-south axis and encourage Japan to build all the east-west axis. Then we will have a very nice grid <laughs> in ASEAN. And if you can encourage India, encourage the US, Europe to come in, that's fine. I don't think they will. I think in the end, it will be China and Japan. And to a limited extent, India into Myanmar. But that requires Myanmar to be stabilized first. Yeah. So with that, we come to the end of today's session. Thank you all for coming today.